Okay, so this is part of the National Building Expert, Ask the Building Expert series. And why do we do this? We do this to help everybody learn and, and get educated on different uh, building and construction topics. And once in a while, we'll throw in uh, a new feature or some kind of uh, highlight, like we did the Florida building collapse and uh, interesting stories like that. And uh, this is me, Lance Luke. And also, um, our webinars are, are designed to help building owners, condo association, uh, board members, resident managers, site managers, property managers, uh, developers, real estate attorneys, anybody who is interested in uh, our topic. Also, homeowners. I mean, if you're a homeowner and you're not necessarily a condo unit owner or board member, this can help you too. If you look at the photo here, this is me uh, at the Millennium Tower in San Francisco. And if you uh, don't know about it, that building's sinking and they're spending millions of dollars trying to uh, fix it from sinking. And I'll probably be doing a webinar on, on that uh, sometime next year. In fact, I'm flying in, in December to San Francisco to check out uh, the work they're doing. I'm also flying to New York because there's a huge litigation case on a brand new building <clears throat> that has a bunch of construction defects. But uh, let's go on with the show. Oh, before that, I'd like to introduce uh, Martin Pea. He's actually the co-host, but he probably won't be talking until the end. And he's the back end guy, making sure that our audio, video, and everything is in sync and we're doing things right. So our topic today is preventive maintenance, avoid a building collapse. And it doesn't necessarily have to be a building. It could be uh, your house somewhere, your beach house, your second house, or whatever kind of uh, building that you have. So let's go right into it. The question of the day is, what is preventive maintenance? And preventive maintenance could be all kinds of different things from making sure that your, your building or your equipment in the building doesn't fail, is properly inspected, is properly tested, uh, things that need to be replaced are replaced in a timely manner. So in other words, you have good operation and good condition of your building components. Now, the definition, and I got this from, uh, I don't know, I forget. Uh, but uh, I, I like this definition, and it's preventive maintenance is a regular and routine maintenance of building components in order to keep them in good condition and save unexpected and costly repairs. So basically, in a nutshell, it's fixing things before the thing breaks, and it doesn't matter what the thing is. It could be a building component, it could be a roof, it could be uh, air conditioning equipment, it could be any number of components in, in a building or let's say uh, in your house. Now, the same holds true in the healthcare industry when you have these medical professionals talking about preventive medicine, preventive healthcare. And of course, as you know, it's way cheaper to be proactive than reactive. In other words, it's cheaper to, to take care of your, your body, your health, rather than you get sick and now you have to go to the hospital and now it's a reactive situation. Same thing with buildings. Okay? You wanna prevent things from occurring in a building that will be very costly to fix and it's an inconvenience when it happens. So, what do you do in this preventive maintenance program or what is this program all about? Well, basically uh, the program is to schedule and perform regular inspections. In other words, you, uh, you know, walk around the building and it doesn't matter whether you're a condo owner, unit owner, a uh, board member, a property manager, a real estate agent selling a unit in the building, it doesn't matter. Uh, anybody can do it and you don't have to be a professional 
if you're just doing the walk around. Now, uh, in the preventive maintenance program, you schedule and perform regular inspections, conduct regular maintenance of building and grounds, repair and replace any defective equipment or any components of the building that need to be repaired or replaced. And I'll talk about more uh, as, as we go. So the number one thing is to actually come up with an inspection program. If you have one for your building, that's fine. Uh, you may want to uh, look at it and see if it's working, see if it covers all the components that need to be inspected. <clears throat> and then what do you do after the report is completed? Do you just file it away or do you take action? And what is the proper protocol? The proper protocol is you get the inspection completed and then you follow up on items that need attention. In other words, uh, fixing, repairing or replacing items that need to be uh, repaired or replaced. So remember, there's no such thing in, in building maintenance as the old adage, set it and forget it, or maybe it's a new, uh, new slogan. You know, you're not making jello and you do the mix and you put it in your refrigerator and set it and forget it. And then when it's time, then you bring it out and eat it. That doesn't happen in the, in the building maintenance industry. There's no such thing as set it and forget it. If any contractor tells you that, then you might ask, uh, are you sure? I don't have to do anything. Do I have to like call you every year for you to come and inspect this certain component? Um, do, do I have to inspect it myself? Is there a warranty? Uh, if so, what does the warranty say? And a lot of times uh, these contractors don't even know what the warranty says. It just spout out, oh, well, it's a five-year warranty. If anything's wrong, we'll come back and, and look at it. But if you read the fine print, such as a roof warranty, it'll say uh, you have to inspect your roof every quarter or every year in order for that warranty to be uh, effective. So in other words, if you don't inspect it and there's a, a claim from a roof leak, the question that the roofer is going to say is, uh, did you do your inspection? And if you say no, the contractor didn't uh, tell me to. They're gonna pull out the fine print in the warranty. So see, this says that you gotta do your inspection. If you didn't do your inspection, we're not covering this. We're charging you for doing the repair. So it's critical that you read your warranty documents and uh, track it. Let's talk about some preventive maintenance procedures. And I'm just gonna go down the list here. Uh, keep it simple and short, keep it safe, keep it logical ask professionals for advice and build accountability. Now, your procedure, keep it simple and short is good, except if it's a uh, uh, high tech maintenance equipment, uh, such as a cooling tower, you don't, there's no way to keep it simple and short. There's like pages and pages of guidelines that need to be followed. Keep it safe. Whoever is doing the work have to follow the proper safety protocols. Keep it logical. It has to make sense. If it's all gibberish and you write out a maintenance procedure and no one can understand it or read it, then it's not logical. It's not simple and it may not be short. Ask professionals for advice, okay? You're not in your own shell. There's many different organizations that you can belong to, or if you don't belong to, you can reach out to other people in the industry, like if you're a realtor, ask other realtors. If you're a site manager, property manager, ask other uh, site or property managers or resident managers uh, that you know, or at other buildings. Say, you know, I, I'm in this high rise building and uh, I have this piece of equipment. Are you familiar with this certain equipment? And the guy says either no or yes. And if he says yes, then say, oh, can you do me a favor? And, tell me about this because I have so-and-so equipment and it's not working. What do you do to maintain it? Okay. Now that's in your own industry. Now you can go outside of that industry and talk to 
other experts, other contractors. Let's say you have a uh, concrete spalling uh, issue. You call up structure engineers or call up construction managers, uh, call up uh, spalling contractors that specialize in that kind of work and kind of ask them, hey, uh, I have this crack here. Can you come check it out? And you know, a lot of times they'll say, send me the picture and let me look at it. Or, yeah, I'll come on and check it. And don't be afraid to ask for advice. A lot of times it's going to be free. And free is good, right? E even if you have to pay, sometimes the advice is worth it. But like what I do, if you're in a condo building or in a townhouse and uh, you're a board member, property manager, and you call up my company and say, I, I don't know if I have to, you know, fix my roof, uh, doesn't look too good. Or I have uh, cast iron drain piping, my building is old. Are you able to come and take a look? And uh, what my company does is say, yeah, let's go and, you know, meet you one day and just take a look. Or I say, send me the picture and I'll look at the photo and I may ask some more questions. Like, where exactly is this? And sometimes people send me a photo of a, a close-up of a pipe and I have no clue. It's, you know, where, first of all, where's the location of the pipe? Is it underground? Is it in a building? If it's in a building, is it a, a common pipe or is it a unit owner's pipe? And what does it serve? Is this a drain pipe, a vent pipe? uh what kind of pipe is it a storm drain and so it's easier for me to actually go to the property than uh, and look at it for myself than actually look at a photo which sometimes people send me 20 photos and i still don't have a clue of what what it is so um the bottom line is ask do your research don't be scared to ask people all they can say is, no, I don't have time to help you. And then you move on and ask somebody else. If build accountability means that if you have a preventive maintenance program for your building, make sure that the people follow up. Who's in charge? Is there a, a building engineer that's the one in charge below the property manager or asset manager, facilities manager? Um, and is there maintenance people under that engineer? Who's the lead guy? And they all have to be accountable. And when I go into buildings to review their preventive maintenance program, I ask, I said, I want to see your last inspection report or report for the past three months. Okay? And then after I review it, where's your log, your daily log to show that the items noted in your inspection report were repaired? And then I say, okay, so you fixed this. Uh, I have a question. Uh, there were cracks you saw on the uh, parking level, concrete cracks, and you fixed it. So my question is, how do you fix? It? How did you fix it? What methods and means did you use? What kind of materials did you use? Uh, I would like the brand name to be sure that the material you use is compatible with the fix. So it makes sense, right? And it may not be micromanaging it's just trying to get to the bottom of things and by the way if you're in a condo and you have problems in your condo okay, and you ask the, the resident manager site manager general manager can you come and check this out i have like noise um, you know it's flapping noises and when i turn on my hood vent i hear these scratching flapping noises uh, and then also once in a while I hear uh, water going through the piping and I hear this knocking sound on my plumbing. And if, if the manager or anybody says, oh, uh, that's normal, then that's a red flag to me. Why? Because where is the criteria of how the person is saying it's normal? What is he getting, what backup does he have in information to uh, discern whether what he says is correct? In other words, if he told me that's normal, I said, oh, okay, 
uh, it's normal, right, to hear this knocking sound in the plumbing. What, what criteria are you using to say it's normal? Are you like a licensed plumbing contractor or are you a, a mechanical engineer? How did you determine that uh, you can make this statement by saying it's normal? If there's five other units that have the same problem, uh, that means it's normal. If, if other buildings have the same problem, does that mean it's then mean it's normal? And then they don't know what to say. Okay, so just be careful. Do not accept information that a third party gives you if they don't have the expertise and experience to back themselves up. Okay, now, me as an expert, if I come in and say, oh, that's normal, you could still say, well, what criteria are you basing your statement on? And then I'll give you the criteria. Okay, so don't just accept the normal, it's not uh, unusual. We hear that noise all the time. We see that condition all the time. It's no big deal. Uh, I don't accept any of that. You know, I listen to it, but I don't necessarily agree with it, okay? So let's move on. Okay, so uh, repair and maintenance. And uh, so there's no such saying in the building maintenance industry as this saying, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Now, what does that mean? Okay, that means that if something is not broken, then don't touch it, then don't fix it. But do you agree with that? I don't agree with it. You know why? Because something could be working and on its last leg and you're not doing anything to maintain it because it's not broken yet. So let me give you this analogy. Most of you guys drive cars, right? So let's say you're driving your car and it still works, but you hear like knocking noises and unusual, uh, it's coming Halloween soon. So unusual uh, ghoulish sounds, unusual sounds you never heard of, ping pong knocking and rattling and all this coming from your, your engine or your, your, you know, car tires or your exhaust, anything. And if you have the opinion that, oh, well, I can still drive it, so I don't need to fix it. Now, what does that tell you? You're ignoring causes that could be a major problem. You know, like, let's say you're driving your car and every time you press on the brake pedal, you hear this screeching noise. <laughs> oh, but my brake still works. Okay, so you don't take it in the shop. Now, what happens if you're going downhill and it's pouring rain and uh, the road's slippery? Do you think your brake is, brakes are going to work then? Right? So it's safety first. And that, to me, it's a good analogy because you don't let the component run down and then have that component break first before you start worrying about it or fixing it. For instance, a roof. If there's a roof leak, you don't, oh, well, we'll just go and patch the thing and, and hopefully it doesn't leak again. Okay, now that might work, but as I go through this presentation, I'll tell you why that's not a very good idea to do if you're using your own maintenance guys that don't know what they're doing. Okay, so you might ask, hey, Lance, fine and good, this whole maintenance program uh, if things need to be fixed, then it goes from a preventive maintenance program to a repair and maintenance program. But the big question is, I heard what you're saying, but what, what building components are you talking about that need to be maintained? Okay. And, and let's say you don't know. I say, here's the components. Why don't, why don't you walk around your building and look and see, see what's there? Okay, and make your own list if there's no list available. And basically, I'm speaking to uh, property managers, site resident managers, building engineers, people who are in charge of maintaining the building, or people who are in charge of people that are in charge of maintaining the building. So if you, most of the buildings around town already have a list. If I go to the building and say, I want to see your, your preventive maintenance list, they can whip it out, and it may be one page, it may be 20 pages, 
Okay, but the main thing is they have such a list. If you don't have a list, or if you do have a list, but you want to cross check it and you're a condo building, use your reserve study as a guide. Pull out your reserve study and look at all the lists of components. All the listing of components from, from A, to, A to Z or one through 500, let's say, should be on your maintenance program list. Okay. Now, the only reason why some component wouldn't be on the list, if it's a major capital improvement project where the condo board decides to hire uh, outside contractor to repair it. Okay? Or if you're a new building and it's a contru construction defect issue that the developer and, and general contractor is going to fix. Okay? But list down everything and then that's a cross check. Okay? If you need help, uh, reach out to us and we can, we can help. What kind of help are we going to give you? We're willing to review. If you have a a maintenance uh, list. If you want us to review it, we'll, we'll review it. Email it to us. We'll take a look and we'll let you know if we think it's a good list or not, or what could be added or what could be taken out. Uh, so that's how we're able to help. Okay. So um, I always tell everybody in this industry that it's not a question of if, but when. So in other words, if somebody says, well, if this air conditioner breaks down, then we'll fix it. And I'm saying, no, it's not if it's going to break down, it's when it's going to break down. So that's the word that I use. That's the words that I use to determine. So nothing is going to be if it breaks down. It's just going to be when and there's time periods of useful life, expected useful life, when you need to repair, or maintain something. And so use a reserve study as a guide. If you don't have a reserve study, then make your own list and go by that. So in other words, if you're a homeowner living in a single family house, you can make your list because you know chances are there's no reserve study. So you look around, oh, I see I have siding and trim and roof of my house and there's electrical plumbing. Well, and foundation and the structure. Those are the major components that you need to be aware of and you need to have it maintained. So moving along, the big question is in-house versus outhouse. In-house versus contract work. So when, who does what? Okay, when do we use our our maintenance people, building engineers that are working on the building, working in the building, employed by the condo association or the shopping center, golf course, office building, hotel, apartment building, or uh, whatever facility it is. You have in-house maintenance guys, engineers. There's a lot of um, offices downtown where they have a building engineer, they have maintenance workers that follow up with stuff, okay? So uh, review the job scope and duties of all the workers in the building and see what they're capable of doing. And even if they can do it, maybe they shouldn't be doing it because although they have the skills to do it, they might not have the certification or they might not have the proper license that's needed or the insurance okay? or, or anything else. So let's move to the next slide. So in concert with that, review and consider. So I asked, um, I was at this building the other day and I asked a maintenance guy, um, you know, what was in his maintenance toolbox? And so he shows, showed it, he gave me the box, I opened it up and I found two things, well, I found three things, but two things in his, in his toolbox. Okay, guess what they were? They were duct tape and WD-40. But, you know, also there was enough room for a spam musubi, okay? So I told him, hey, um, I have more tools in my first aid kit than you have in your 
in your toolbox there. So um, here's what you're going to do for maintenance workers. You're going to review and consider their skill sets, licensing requirements, insurance coverage, OSHA regulations, and there's others that I didn't include, such as uh, building permits, building codes, and those kind of things. So with respect to the skill sets, okay, uh, you don't want your yard maintenance guys doing plumbing work, concrete repair, electrical, air conditioning. Um, I'll give you an example. Uh, this building wanted to save money, so they had their uh, yard yard maintenance guys. Uh, they asked, well, do you know how to drink a, dig a trench to fix this broken irrigation line? They said, oh, yeah, we know how to do that. So they rented a trench digger. They started digging a trench so that they can, you know, dig up their irrigation line that was leaking. And then guess what? They hit the gas line. So there was like six townhouse buildings that had to be evacuated because of a gas leak. Now, uh, they didn't read any, any map or plan showing where the gas line was. There was no toning. Toning is where you have somebody bring in a machine and it detects underground piping, you know, metal piping. They, they didn't do any of that. So they didn't know that they were supposed to do it because it was the landscape maintenance guy, see? So this is an example of you don't want guys doing stuff that did not qualify for. Um, electrical repair. Uh, if you look at the photo on the top right, uh, you know, the guy that did the work, uh, he was their maintenance guy in his previous job. He worked at Hawaiian Electric. So they said, hey, you worked at Hawaiian Electric. Why don't you go uh, fix the lighting? And then, uh, you know, we want to add more lights in our meeting room. So we have board meetings, you know, it looks nice and bright. And so the guy did the work. And uh, when I went to inspect it, this is what I saw, uh, a lot of spaghetti wiring. And I'm thinking, what happened here? And the, the resident manager said, oh, uh, I don't know. The guy used to work at Hawaiian Electric. And so we tracked the guy down and says, oh, I don't think you did a good job here. Uh, you used to work at Hawaiian Electric. Yeah, what did you do? And he said, oh, I, I, uh, I, I worked in the mailroom. So don't think that because someone says they worked at Hawaiian Electric, they know electrical work, okay? So ask more questions. If you look at the photo next to it, this is of Kahala Mall. They had some corrosion on the foundation of the uh, metal columns holding up their parking deck. And the work is good because they hired a licensed contractor to do the work, okay? Um, what about this plumbing? Look at the photo where they used a lot of duct tape because there were plumbing leaks. It's, you know, I, I don't know if uh, the, the words on the duct tape, uh, when you buy the duct tape, is there like a, a manual that says it's good for plumbing? Uh, I don't know, but it may have worked for a while, but it's kind of sloppy. And then the maintenance guys of another building uh, that had cast iron drain piping they went in to fix the leak and then while they were fixing the leak, they caused another leak and and they were working in a 20 story building and it leaked down to like the eighth floor. So that's not good. Were they licensed plumbers? No, they were maintenance guys that worked in the building. Uh, license re, you know, licensing requirements. Are, are these maintenance guys licensed to do a certain kind of work? If you look at the photo on the bottom right, uh, it's they had bad drainage of a townhouse and they hired a licensed contract to do the work. So that's the proper way to do things. Now, I'll give you an example. This uh, condo board in Kailua, there's a bunch of townhouses that have cedar shaped roofing and the roofing isn't only on top of the roof, it actually extends to the sides, but that's considered uh, roofing material too. So cedar shaped. They got a bid, they got several bids and from different contractors and the lowest bid was $2 million. And the manager said, the resident manager said, uh, I know how to do the work, 
I can do it and save you $1 million. And so the board said, wow, this is going to be good. So you're hired. Um, all, you, all they need to do is buy the, uh, the shingles, right, and assorted other building materials uh, to go with the roofing project. And uh, the, the maintenance uh, guys would help the resident manager that said he knew how to do the shingles. And you know what happened? The manager fell off the roof and made a $2 million workman's comp claim. Okay, so what happened to the $1 million that was saved? Was there really a savings at the end? Uh, not really. The guy wasn't licensed. And when I went to do the inspection, he, he did it all wrong. So I have to tell the board, it says, you know, you guys thought you could save a million dollars. Guess what? Not only do you have a $2 million workman's comp claim, now you have to spend $2 million to redo all the bad work that the guy did because you didn't hire a construction manager to monitor the work. You decide to call me in after the fact and it's all messed up. So, I mean, you should have seen their faces after I told them that. So not nice. Uh, insurance coverage. Here's a good question. Ask all the workers, well, ask the question, can the workers, the maintenance workers, act like licensed contractors? In other words, what is their criteria? And I did my own research, and in the condo insurance world, the maintenance workers that are employees of the condo association or the hotel or office building, okay, they're not covered by insurance if they climb a ladder higher than six feet. And go ahead and check with your insurance agents and ask them. They cannot do that kind of work. If they do, uh, will the insurance cover the claim? Maybe, maybe not. The other thing is there's a fine print in the insurance policy that says, if you do not follow the building code, we may not need to cover if there's a, a, a claim. Okay, so do these maintenance guys or managers, site managers, property manager know what the building codes are? I don't think so. I know what the building codes are. And when I go to the property, it says, you know what, this is, doesn't meet code. And they go, well, uh, you know, the plumber said it did. Okay, well then ask the plumber, can you, send me a copy of the code section that this is allowed, that you're allowed to vent a gas water heater so close to a, a occupant window. Oh, well, it's grandfathered in. Well, would it be grandfathered in if you, if you re remove the water heater and put it in a different location? And so anyway, it gets really technical. Now, what about OSHA regulations? You know, I've seen Maintenance guys do drywall repair. They're not wearing a mask, uh, concrete demo. They don't have any safety goggles. They're not wearing steel-toed shoes. Um, they don't have any proper PPE. The maintenance guy goes, I know how to weld. I go there and look and he's not wearing any safety gloves or eye protection. The best was uh, dry, the guys, the maintenance guys doing drywall work. And I go, hey, you don't have a mask and he has you know the mask that we wear for the uh, coronavirus? He had one of those on. And I'm going, that's not the proper mask to wear. That's the mask you wear when you're walking around the building. That's not a mask you wear doing drywall work. Come on, get with the program. Oh, uh, I'll just get another one and I'll have two. I said, okay, I guess it's OSHA approved and you, you know better than me. Okay, so another consideration, and this is very important, so... Pay attention. Labor and material warranties. If you do work in-house, you use your in-house people, are you getting a labor and material warranty the same as if you hired an outside contractor? The answer is no. Okay. So look at these photos. It's a asphalt shingle roof and they had some cracks in the roof and uh, there was a leak and the maintenance guy went to fix it. Is there a warranty? No, there's no labor warranty. There's no material warranty because uh, 
uh, type of shingle it is, you have to be a certified roofing applicator to do any repair. So that was wrong already. They didn't read the fine print. Here's another photo of a drain pipe with duct tape. The, by the way, you know, the duct tape job on this thing looks pretty nice. I would say uh, they get an A and they get an A for, uh, you know, duct tape wrapping. But is uh, if you ask any plumbing contractor, is duct tape the proper material to use to, to fix a plumbing leak? The answer is going to be no. Okay. What about the photo on the right where the guy didn't have electrical experience? He wired the outlet backward. And when someone plugged in a vacuum cleaner, there wasn't a there was a, a little explosion and you see all the black area and it was a short circuit and they got to buy a new vacuum now. Uh, somebody could have got really hurt from this. So if the people aren't skilled, don't do the work, don't have them do the work. You're not going to get any labor and material warranty if you, owe, if you use your in-house crew. Okay. And maybe you don't care because you're saving money, but what happens if, if there's a major catastrophe, like you're fixing the roof and then the roof leaks again, okay, what are you going to do? Sue yourself? That doesn't make any sense. Speaking of suing, let's talk about insurance claims and lawsuits, okay? So I'll give you an example. No one wants to get sued and you don't want to get rejected on insurance claim. Here's a, here's a typical example. You have a... Um, a roof of a condo building, okay, and and it costs one million dollars to to repair, uh, to replace, okay, one million dollars to replace the roof. The board says we don't have the money, so they hire their maintenance guy to go and patch the roof. Okay, so the guy patches the roof, the thing still leaks, and guess what? It leaks into a three million dollar penthouse unit. Now, the unit owner is not happy. He ends up suing the association and the board saying, you're not maintaining the property and you're damaging my unit. So I want you to fix my unit, but I want you to fix the roof first. Now what happens? Now they got to go hire, uh, they tender a claim to the insurance company, the insurance company gets involved, and then it's actually going to cost a lot more money to get the problem solved. So you don't want to get into that situation. Now, in addition to the leaky roof, guess what? There's damaged drywall, there's mold growing, uh, there's damage to the uh, unit owner's antique furniture and paintings. And what is the value of that? All they need to do is provide some kind of uh, report showing that they had their uh, furniture and paintings appraised and here's what it costs and here's what it costs to to fix this so it's not just fixing the building it could be components and water's dripping on the nice uh, laminate flooring that was installed and now they gotta replace the flooring to the tune of forty thousand dollars so it, it can add up. So the big question is, what, what are the tips to avoid a building collapse, right? You don't want the building to collapse. So I just, I just gave you all the tips, okay? And that's my expert advice. You don't want your building to end up being like the Florida building that, that fell down, right? So uh, let's move along. Um, what you've missed, you didn't miss anything by attending this seminar, but we've gave uh, previous webinars, okay? So if you didn't attend the previous webinars, this is what you missed. I gave webinars on contractor licensing, construction defects, building safety, concrete spoiler repair, uh, cast iron drain piping, construction warranties, roofing, painting, air conditioning, premises liability, reserve studies, uh, Florida building collapse and uh, fire life safety. There's a bunch more that I didn't mention, but uh, if you missed it, you can always watch it on the on-demand webinars that we have on, on our uh, website. So uh, 
you didn't really miss it because you can always watch it. Now, what's coming up for future webinars? In, uh, in, in a couple of weeks, I'm giving one on asphalt and uh, somebody told me they like the titles, uh, asphalt, uh, avoid the project so it's not a pain in the asphalt or something like that. Now, wood repair, flooring, flooring is actually in condos, sound transmission issues, I'm covering that. Um, and then we're having a uh, online uh, webinar party, a holiday party. And uh, you have to be present to win. It's going to be music, games, prizes, and all that. You have to register on Zoom. We're probably broadcasting on Facebook, but uh, in order to win, participate in the contest and win prizes, you have to do it through our Zoom um, website. And I like this photo. This is of me uh, being interviewed on the Times Square Today show and talking about building safety and all that. So uh, at this time, I'd like to wake up Martin and we're going to uh, do the Q&A. So uh, before we get into that, our phone number is 422-2132. Website is askbuildingexpert.now.site and you can go there and uh, watch our uh, replay of webinars that we've done. I, I don't know if we're giving away a free book or not but uh, if, if, if not if you can't find it reach out to us and we'll send you the link to the free building safety book and uh, right now I'll take uh, whatever questions comments you guys have so let's open it up right now Martin are you there I'm here Lance I'm here I'm gonna okay, ask my good. question I'm gonna ask my question first because I posted it on on Facebook too Hey, wait is, a minute! Uh, you're 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 a co-host. You're supposed to ask yours last. Oh, okay, okay. I'll do that then. Okay. <laughs> I'm only kidding. No, you can ask your question. No, no, as a as a homeowner, do you have a preventive maintenance list for homeowners? You know, I was thinking that's something that uh, homeowners should get when they buy their house. How to keep it and maintain it? Yeah. Do you, do you uh, have a no, good question. I, I don't have a list per se, but we could certainly make one. Why don't Why don't we we put together one and we can uh post it on our publication section of our website and people can grab it there sounds good sounds good good idea okay, okay. let me hit the questions that have that have come in here um first one i have here is i live in a condo and my board always takes the low cost method to save money by using our maintenance people who do not have the experience to do the work sounds like people you've been talking about so what do i do to stop this uh, sell your condo and move out. <laughs> so here's, here's some tips. Okay? You, you be active. Uh, why don't you join the board or show up at board meetings and, and voice your opinion. Send emails out to the uh, property management board and voice your opinion and say, um, I don't think this is the right best practice. And I think that uh, you guys shouldn't use the cheaper route all the time. And here's the reasons why. Is the is there, you going cheaper, what kind of warranty are we getting? What's the expertise of these people doing the work? Are they licensed contractors? Um, if not, should they be licensed? What is the criteria that the board it, it makes for hiring these people? Ask all these questions. and and just keep hounding them until you get the answers or, or they give up or they change their ways because going cheap is not necessarily the best way to do things, especially if you got to fix it again next year when you already paid money, you're throwing you know, good money after bad because you didn't do the proper uh, way to fix things in the first place. So that's the whole idea. You just keep on top of it. And tell, tell the board, you know, I was attending this webinar from this national building expert and he was saying, these are the things you should do. Are you guys doing that? And uh, just, just keep up. Remember, it's your money. You're paying maintenance fees. You own your condo unit. You have an expectation uh, that your building is gonna be fixed properly. And 
if you need backup, go to the uh, Hawaii condo law, HRS 514B, and it's right there in black and white that the board member's fiduciary duty is to maintain the property and maintain the property uh, correctly. Okay, so uh, good. Any okay, other next, questions? Next, next question, Lance, is um, you mentioned contractor licensing. Can you give us more examples of work that requires a license? Well, there's like um, 68 separate contractor licenses. Okay? And if you're on this webinar and you're not from Hawaii, okay, it may be a little different, but in Hawaii, there's almost a contractor license needed for, for everything. And I'll give you an example. If there's uh, sidewalks that um, need to be fixed and it's on grade, you don't need a contractor's license. You can basically fix it. Okay? But if it's suspended, you know, like a parking deck or you have a, uh, you're doing spawning repair on the side of a building and the value of the, the work exceeds $1,500, that triggers the requirement to get a licensed contractor. So guarantee electrical plumbing work, you need a licensed contractor. Okay. All the other work, there's a, a threshold of value. So needless to say, almost every kind of work needs a license. There's buildings all over town where they're doing work and they're not using licensed contractors. They're not getting a building permit. Why? Because um, that's how it's been done all these years. Is it right? No, it's not. But sometimes they, they have to do it that way in order to get things done. So, um, you know, roofing work, concrete work, electrical plumbing, uh, major things like that. Even irrigation, believe it or not, you, you need a license to do irrigation work if it's more than $1,500. So um, I, I like the questions. Keep them coming. Okay, Lance, here's the next one. Uh, my building is falling apart. Hmm. No one seems to care. What can we do to get things fixed? I'm, th I'm thinking that it's probably a condo building or an apartment building. If it's an apartment building, well, regardless if it's an apartment building or a condo building, you go to uh, the owner. And who's the owner? Well, the owner of an apartment building is going to be a, a one person or a family or an entity. Okay, the condo building, the owner is the association of apartment owners or whatever the entity is. Okay? And who runs the association? It's the board. So you have to go to the board and there's a property manager. So you have to go to the board and the property manager to voice your opinion and say, I don't think uh, the building is maintained properly, but back it up. In your letter, take pictures, send photos of, of these things. Pictures tell a thousand words. If you have color photos of concrete cracking or potholes in the asphalt uh, or hanging electrical wires, I mean, those pictures say a lot and basically it's not like somebody spouting off, complaining uh, that the building doesn't have proper maintenance. You're actually saying, and you're backing it up with the photos and they can't deny the photos once you send it. And uh, I don't usually like to tell people this, but if you feel it's a health and safety issue, and let's say, for example, you have railing and there's spalling on the railing base and the railing is loose. That's a safety issue, right? If the, if the condo board or owner doesn't do anything about it, guess what? You're forced to call the city building inspection department and have the city come in and look at it. And most likely they're gonna issue a violation notice. Okay, so um, I don't like to do that to, to get people in trouble. But if that's the only recourse, then that's the recourse that you have to take to get the building fixed up. And you're, 
you're actually not only helping yourself, you're helping all the people who live in the building because maybe uh, the majority of people don't want to say anything because the, the boards run like some kind of uh, political machine where they don't listen to anybody. And they just do whatever they want. Okay? So, and believe it or not, boards have been sued by unit owners before. So just keep that in mind. So it's not like there's no hope. There's things that you can do uh, to, to help the cause. Okay. Any other questions? Well, yep, got a couple more here. Here's an important one. Uh, what specific documents should, should a buyer look at to discern whether an association has a financial challenge, uh, like the manager who tried to fix the roof and then fell? in your example. Okay, um, so the documentation, is this pertaining to like an owner or uh, someone buying a condo? Uh, I, I think it's related to that uh, example that you gave today. Um, oh, okay, well, I, it, it doesn't matter because the documentation that's required is the same. So let's say either I was a buyer of a condo or I was an owner in a condo building and I wanted to know what finances they had. And, and by the way, I'm on six boards, uh, three of them are condo boards. So I know, I not only know the building uh, construction side of it and maintenance, I know the real estate property management side too uh, as, as a board member. But anyway, the documentation that you need to look at is the financial statements and the budgets. There's two different budgets. There's an operating budget, which is day-to-day, -day, and there's a uh, reserve budget. Okay, so you look at those and you look at the numbers. Also, there's a very important document called a reserve study. So the reserve study would basically tell you what things, what building components need to be replaced at what time and at what cost. Okay, so that's an important document, but be aware that the reserve study that you're looking at may not be based on a total 100% funding. And if you need more information about that, uh, watch our webinar on uh, reserve studies because there's a lot of reserve studies out there that are only 50% funded. And so it's very misleading. So that reserve study document is very important because you can tell, I can tell by looking at the bottom line, whether they have enough money or not and looking at the line items. So for instance, if they have uh, $1 million that they need and they, it matches with the funds that they're collecting. Okay, well that matches, but if you go to the cast iron drain piping replacement line item and it says $60,000 and the building is a high rise building with 200 units, you got to ask yourself, well, what, what's up with this? This, this number doesn't, 60,000 isn't going to pay for a cast iron drain piping project that costs millions of dollars. So something is amiss here. The other thing is, Upgrading a fire alarm system. If you, the building is 35, 40 years old and they have a light item uh, fire alarm system uh, repairs and it says $15,000, it's like they're way off because to replace a fire alarm system in a high risk building, you may look, be looking at 750,000. So, you know, question the items in the reserve study to make sure they're they're accurate. A lot of times it's not correct because of various reasons and you want to know what those reasons are. So yeah, good question. Good answer, yeah. Lance. Okay, get a, a couple more here. This one says, I understand the preventive maintenance concept. Can you give us the categories of the things we should be inspecting and fixing? Sounds like my list. Yeah. Why don't you start making a list, Martin, and I'll review it. So. <laughs> Um, basically, let's take a high-rise condo building or uh, uh, let's take a townhouse, townhouse building. Okay, so there's uh, uh, components would be roads, 
your lighting, your trees. And then when you look at the building, you have grounds, you have walls, fences, the building foundation structure, siding, uh, painting, and you have the roof. And then you also have your uh, other components such as your plumbing systems, mechanical systems and electrical system. Basically that's the major components. And then of course you add in all these other ones like a pool pump, motor, um, you know, and other, other things like that. That's in a, a townhouse. In a high rise building, you have the exact same components, but then you add in your uh, mechanical system, air conditioning, fire alarm system, elevators, uh, escalators, and you know, whatever else. So as you probably know, a high rise building has many more components than a three story townhouse building. And all these new buildings that are built in Kaka'ako today, they got like 500 or more components. So uh, there's a lot of stuff going, going in. And Nothing lasts forever. Things need to be fixed and maintained throughout the years. So even if there's a expected life of 40 or 50 years, it may not last that long and it still should be covered in the, in the reserve study. So what else do we have? Oh, thanks Lance. Yeah, we get uh, one more here, interesting one. Should we really be worried about our building? I thought the city building inspector's job is to inspect our building. Okay, they're very good, very good subject. So let me clear the misconceptions out on, on this one. When, when a new building is built, before the building is built, the plans are submitted to the building department for review. When the building starts construction, while the building is under construction, the building inspector inspects the building to completion. Once the building inspector uh, signs off and issues a certificate of occupancy, that's it. They don't have any obligation to ever go to the building again. And I'm talking about the city building inspector. Now, there's other inspectors that would go to the building every year, such as a fire inspector and elevator inspector. But the general building inspector, no, there's no... There's no obligation, there's no such program, inspection program in place in Hawaii that has a mandatory uh, building inspection done. So you could have a building built 40 years ago and the building inspector never went once after 40 years, okay? They only go when there's a complaint and they're forced to go and, and take a look at something. So there's a misunderstanding that the building department is going to be doing the inspections. No, it's a self-monitoring situation where each building owner, and whether it's a condo, office building, apartment building, has to self-inspect. And that's what that's called a self-monitoring inspection program, where the city building department, DPP, is basically saying each owner has an obligation to inspect their own property. We're not the ones that are inspecting, we're only inspecting new, or let's say there's a renovation done, then they'll go and inspect it, but otherwise there's no obligation. So uh, be careful. That's why the onus is on the building owner, the building owners, condos, property managers, board members to properly inspect the building. And when I say properly, if you don't have the wherewithal or the experience to do your own inspections, then hire out. Okay, hire an expert. Hire a company that does inspections for a living and knows what they're doing and can give you a, a nice report. And then, you know, don't take the report and file it away. Take the report as your action list item and look at the things that are flagged and, and do something about it. The problem with the Florida building is that they had a report and they had no money. And so they were just like in a quandary. Well, we don't know what to do. We don't have the money. We're gonna to have to raise the money. And in the meantime, the building falls down and that's not where you wanna be. That's why the topic of today is pre prevent and maintenance, avoid your building falling down, okay? avoid a building collapse. So 
Uh, we got any other questions or comments on uh, Zoom or Facebook? I think that's uh, that's all we get for today. But good job, very informative. Thank you. No, no comments on Facebook. I'm surprised. Oh, Maybe good. they'll comment later. Yeah, you can check your Facebook. Yeah, you'll see. Okay, so um, appreciate everybody for attending, and we're going to be signing off. And be sure to sign up for or show up at Facebook Live for the next webinar which would be an asphalt uh, repaving. That should be very interesting. I'm actually working on a couple of things right now regarding asphalt. So um, thank you for attending. On behalf of myself and Martin and Ask the Building Expert uh, webinar series, uh, call on us if you have any uh, questions or if you have any ideas for future topics. Oh, by the way, I got 22 interesting topics that uh, we have uh, I'm working on for uh, 2022 for next year. So uh, once again, appreciate you tuning in and I'll see you again on the next one. Aloha.